All right, we're about to start our Easter service here at Malibu Pacific Church. If you are outside, come on inside. We're starting our service. Was that the alarm? I hit snooze. Was that the first time it went off? Oh no! How many times did you hit that thing? I dreamt I hit it like nine times. That wasn't a dream. We're going to be late for Easter service. Wake up, wake up, wake up, come on. Wake up, it's Easter, we're late! Wake up, wake up, ow, 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 wake up, this is not a drill. Do we do drills? You better hurry. We get breakfast. Peeps! You guys help each other. You! Uh, the surprise! I was a surprise. No! You! My name is Molly. Well, let's get moving. Come on, close her on the drift. What's a surprise? Did you tell Molly she was a surprise? Oh, I'm so tired that she's lucky that's all I said. Honey, which time? Not that one. How do you know which? Your first choice is always bad. <laughs> The doggy? Uh, yep. You can finish in the car. Go, 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 Is everybody in here? Noah, Mary, Molly. We're good. Grandpa's not coming? Grandpa! It's a great day for golf here at Augusta National. Today at the Masters, final Wide open. Come on. You can dress in the car. He cannot dress in the car. My children are in there. Can't you just let an old man rest in peace? Does everybody have shoes? Oh, it's too late for that now. Don't tell me if you don't. My socks don't match. My shirt has a stain. I only have flip flops. Just turn around. We look like a circus. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. He is risen. Hey, no matter how crazy your morning might have been getting here, we're just glad that you're here, and we're glad that we get to worship our risen king together. So let's stand up, and let's sing to our God together. Thank you. 
Christ has led. Hallelujah. Following our exalted end. Good morning, good morning. You may be seated. We are so excited. Good morning and happy Easter, everybody. Yeah, awesome. This is so exciting. My name is Joel. I work here at Malibu Pacific Church. Whether you're here on site or online watching right now, we're so happy that you're here. How great is it we had to actually add tons of chairs in this room right now? Come on, that's an amazing problem to have. Which shows, if you come to church late, we're going to seat you in the front, okay? So don't come late ever. You want to sit in the back, trust me. So excited that you are here this morning for this beautiful Easter time. If you're still looking for a seat, uh, please find one of our ushers in the back, one of our host team, and we'll find you a seat here as well. Um, what a beautiful day. The fog is burning off. Look through the windows. You guys made it to the sanctuary in Malibu Pacific Church. And again, welcome here. This place is for everybody and every story. Uh, what to expect here uh, this morning in these next five hours as we're here together? I'm just, just kidding. Some of you are like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> we're here for about an hour, okay? And during our service, we typically go, we sing some worship songs together. If you know those songs, sing aloud as loud as you want, even if you can't keep a tune. That's okay too. We don't judge here. If you don't know the songs, just enjoy the words, enjoy the amazing uh, worship team we have. This is Well Collective. Everybody say hi to them. Hi, Well Collective. <laughs> We're so thankful they're leading us in song this morning. And then we have about a four-hour sermon from our uh, pastor, Andy. All right? So, just kidding. It's only like four or three hours, I guess. Um, no, it's about 20 minutes long. And we really hope that you're here and you hear this amazing message and that it's inspirational, that you leave here wanting to learn more. The next step. If you are brand new this morning here for our Easter service, I want to say a special welcome. We would love to get to know you more. We have an info table in the back. We'd love to get your email address to tell about certain events that are coming up. Also, we'd love to get your checking account and mother's maiden name um, so that we can really stay connected. I'm totally kidding, all right? If this is your first time at a church or a church service, welcome. If this is your millionth time, welcome. We're glad you're here. So uh, something that we have that's going on, that's brand new to this church, we have an app. And you're like, whoa, an app, yes, for a smart uh, device. We actually encourage you to be on your phone if you feel comfortable, because we're the cool church. Um, and uh, what you want to do is download that app. It's a great resource. It has a ton of videos, add-ons, extras. You want to find out about events. You want to register for those things. It's also a concierge service. There's a little button on there, if you can find it, that says, bring me coffee. And we will bring you coffee, okay? But it's hidden deep in the app, so you have to try and find it, okay? So if, like, the sermon's not that great, maybe that, I'm totally kidding. Andy, please don't fire me. Um, check that app out. Download it because it is a great resource and a great tool here that we use here at Malibu Pacific Church. Also, um, we have the best children's and student programs in the history of forever. Let me tell you this. We have our brand new children's center and student center. Our children's area is right across the way. You'll see it looks like a Lion King symbol, like, because we hold the kids up while they come. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we bring them over there. You can check them in, and guess what? Parents, 
free childcare, all right? Just, it's free 99, okay? We don't want you to parent alone, and also we want to get your kid checked into the system so that we can take care of them. We have amazing volunteers, all background checked, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very safe space and bold place to do ministry here. Also, downstairs, we have our awesome student center, but today, for this Easter service, they're going to be here from 4th through 12th grade. They're inside the service, but they have amazing youth ministry or youth groups on Tuesday nights. Check those out. Since you all downloaded the app, I saw you all do that. Thank you so much. Um, you, can, you can check out that event and sign them up for their age bracket, okay? Last thing, I promise. I only have like 20 more announcements. Just kidding. I have one more, and this is really important, okay? We are already having so much fun here, right? It's Easter service. You finally made it. You made it a parking spot. Hopefully, you got some pancakes. Hopefully, you got to meet somebody new. You see this beautiful area outside. You see the beach. This Friday night, this is not just a typical church service or for church people. This is for a com- all the community, everybody, everybody's invited to this. We have a brand new event called April Foolishness. And check this out. We have free dinner, pizza, okay? Are you tired of paying for food for your family on Friday nights? Well, guess what? Free 99. Bring them. Bring a friend. Bring an enemy. Who cares? Because this is the uh, Dana Daniels is a famous, world-renowned comedian, magician who's going to be here. He was runner-up on America's Got Talent, and that's the only reason why we got him here. So, um, (laughs) just kidding. He's probably watching. Sorry, Dana. Anyways, um, but also, uh, if you're a Disneyland fan, I'm a huge Disneyland fan. Uh, He was the comedian magician at the Golden Horseshoe inside of the park for 20-plus years. And it's a completely free night. So, if you have a terrible time, we will refund you, okay? I just want you to know that. You get all your money back. It's all free. So, just come Come on out this Friday, 5.30 dinner, 6.30 show. It's going to be awesome. We are so excited we get to gather together like this this morning. And it's so amazing to see so many faces in this place. We know we've been through a lot. And whatever you're walking in with, I just want you to know you are welcomed here. We are so, so grateful that we get to gather like this again. And it's going to be a great service. It's going to be a good day. And it's going to be a great week. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord. We don't do life alone. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for the safe travels here. God, whether it's our first time or our millionth time at a church service, Lord, let us meet you in a way that we've maybe haven't experienced before. God, thank you for what you did and that we get to celebrate what you did here today in this place. We love you so much. It's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Today we celebrate a risen Jesus. And that risen Jesus invites us into that resurrection, that restoration, that redemption. So if there's pain, if there's darkness in your life, our God is drawing you toward the love and the light of Christ. And we're going to sing about that. I was buried shame and who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn till I made I was breathing the night alive My failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You call my name.
Then came the morning, it sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. You God gives us hope, our God renews, our God restores. And we love those stories and we love hearing those stories from within our community. So here's a video about God doing that in a family from our church. I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I knew that I needed to provide for my wife. I knew I wanted to do something that was God honoring. We had um, our pastor, we called him Uncle Spanky. Yeah. He was just a really charismatic man. I just remember one day after he was preaching, he was one of those preachers that would come off the pulpit and yeah. walk the aisles He's and stuff like that. Get in your face, like, because it's just, you know, everybody knows everybody's business. So, <laughs> um, but he actually, he, he kind of challenged me, he was like, what are you going to do with your life? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you're going to Pepperdine. God has blessed you. Like, so what are you going to do with that privilege that you have been blessed with? In 2011, I went to Vanguard University to receive my master's. While I was there, I ran into a wonderful woman um, named Professor Gill, uh, Mickey Gill. Mickey Gill. She was um, just instrumental in different decisions that I had to make in my life, knowing that like she'll tell me what it is mm -hmm. that I needed to hear, not right. what I wanted and to she'll, hear. Yeah, she'll give I, it to you straight. Like, and her influence was just crazy. I was an administrator in, in LAUSD, but it was something that she told me. She said, Terrell, I was a, a principal too, and I made this decision, you know, 25 years ago. And she said, what you have to understand is the difference between the quality of life and the quantity of life. And she said, if you take this position or if you choose to come to Vanguard, mm -hmm. the quality of your life is going to change. Yes. So her words of encouragement were, you're going to apply. <laughs> Those were her words of encouragement. It wasn't like, oh, you know, she said, no, you're going to apply. And I ultimately get the position and it just completely changed our lives. Yes. I landed in teacher education and I guess that's where God wanted me because <laughs> I'm back teaching in the same program that came out of, uh, you know, back in 2008 being able to pour into the lives of future teachers, being able to pour into the lives of students on campus. It was just a crazy blessing that we didn't see. God always put a person in our life to just speak 
like direct instruction almost like no you need to do this and it was always in that loving way i come from a family 40 years of foster care and so that kind of was in my heart. We were like, okay, yeah, like let's look into this. And that was back in what, 2010? Ten. We see foster care as a ministry. Mm -hmm. I am a heart mommy to so many babies, even the children that have come into our home and left. And we always say, any child that's coming through our home, they're gonna get Jesus. They're gonna get Jesus, whether it's a day or whether it's for a lifetime. We really, really, really teach our children even now. And when we mentor people and younger couples, obedience, 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 obedience. Every step that we took from 2006 and beyond, we were obedient to what God called. God sent those people in our lives to mentor us and shape our identity in Christ, our identity as a family and submitting my will to God um, allowed me and my wife to be able to hear the word of God, even when it's spoken through someone and be able to be obedient and have faith that the Lord will be faithful to his word. And that I think that's a part of identity development as well. And knowing who you are yes. is knowing whose you are, right? right. Who I belong to. Yeah. And if I know that I belong to the Lord Jesus, when I surround myself with godly wisdom, I mean, that's scripture. When I surround myself with godly wisdom and people who are speaking godly wisdom into my life, then I know that it's from God, especially when it's hard. So this is our, the sales. this is the sales family. <laughs> Well, will you all give a big round of applause for the sales family who, yeah. Uh, the sales, Portia and Terrell, you might have seen them this morning and their kids um, running around. Uh, they have been a part of our church for a year now uh, when they moved back to the area and we're looking for a, a place to belong to. And so that's their story. There are many other beautiful stories in the midst of this place of um, saying just, hey, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what's gone on in your life, if you're asking that question, uh, what what am I supposed to do with my life? Um, or, well, I guess God wants me to be here. Um, and then as they pursued mentors and um, guidance from God, we want to be a church that does that for all of you and for everyone here in this place. And so um, we are a church that wants to be for everybody and every story. And so today, if you, if that's a comfort to you, uh, if you're like, okay, what am I doing here? Somebody uh, drag me along with them to church on Easter. Um, but if you are in this area, we just want to extend a warm welcome to you and say that uh, this could be a place uh, where you could belong and grow and um, find community, find uh, your your purpose, your belonging here. So anyway, my name is Sayona. I'm on staff here, and I'm just glad you're here this morning. This is a time for us to do a, an offering, a special Easter offering. And the, all the people that belong to this church uh, participate by many things. They serve. You see them with their shirts on that say here to help. Uh, we are involved with a lot of ministries and ongoing things, but in other ways through their generous tithes and offerings. And so um, we want to invite you into this time of offering, and maybe this is an opportunity for you to give as well to the many things that this church is doing right here in this room when the people and the stories that are happening here in the community as we reach out to bless this community and as we re reach even into the world to participate in the work of goodness and justice beyond these walls. So um, we are going to have the host team come forward and there are three ways to give today. The app that Joel was talking about earlier, you can give on that app if you don't have a checkbook or cash with you. You can give here in person in the baskets that are being passed around. You can go online and give a one-time gift. There are envelopes in the seat backs today 
for the special Easter offering. So if you are making an Easter offering, a one-time gift, would just love, if you want to write something down in there, would love to know that God prompted your heart to give today. And um, we just want to say thank you for your generosity. When you give, you contribute to life change stories like you just saw. So thank you. And I'm going to pray over our offering and we're going to pass those baskets around as you watch uh, another short video. So let's pray. God, thank you that you are a generous and good God, that you love us, that you weave our stories um, together just perfectly, and that you have a good plan for each of us. And so as we hear of Portia and Terrell's story, and as we are blessed by their story in our midst, God, would you remind every person here today that their story matters, and that your story, ultimately the one we're going to hear today about your death and your resurrection is where we can find our ultimate purpose. And so God, prompt our hearts, help us to follow you and um, to respond today as you speak to us. And we pray over this offering that you uh, would be in charge of it, that you would see where it goes and that you would do a good thing through this blessing. Many people helping people uh, with this special offering that we are giving back to you today, God. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, tell me what happened. I was there. They crucified him. I can show you where they buried him. What difference does it make at this point? I understand. But just start from the beginning. Well, it was amazing. A few years back, a guy shows up making all kinds of crazy claims. He spent most of his time at the river. That's where I would go to listen. Then one afternoon, he just stops, mid-sentence points and says, look. So we all looked. Look, he said, the Lamb of God. <laughs> Just what we all needed, right? A lamb? That's the first time I saw him. The lamb, that is. Jesus. You were with Jesus as well. I was for three years, right up until, well, yesterday. It was amazing. He was amazing. And the crowds, oh, I've never seen so many people in one place. And it was everywhere, everywhere we went. More crowds. They came to listen. They came to watch. Some came to criticize. Others to be healed. And he touched, he touched untouchable people and and they were healed. I'm not sure I understand. He was healing people, but you seem offended. He told a man his sins were forgiven. People are so naive. Only God can forgive sin. His followers made mockery of the law, and he never lifted a finger to stop them. He would defend them. He would defend them and criticize us. Us! I was there the day he claimed to be greater than the temple. Then the rumors started. Rumors that he would actually destroy the temple. And the ignorant peasants he surrounded himself with believed him. Worse than peasants. Sinners. Tax gatherers. Women. He told me about me, the part of me that, that shames me. But I didn't feel shame that afternoon. Before that day, I can't remember when I haven't felt shame. But that day, that day I felt alive. They knew we were 
coming. Now, by that time, they, they knew every move we made. We didn't know who to trust. But that, that didn't concern him. So, off we went into the jaws of the lion, Jerusalem. And the whole world was waiting for us. They lined the streets. The sound of their shouts was deafening. And I'll admit, it, it, it went to our heads. But not him. He seemed preoccupied. I, w I would say worried, but I'm not sure that he ever worried. And then things got strange. He made Passover all about him. You know, he, he said the bread was his body and, and the wine was his blood. And we were used to that kind of thing, but, but this seemed more unusual than normal, even for him. Then he announced a new covenant. We had no idea what that meant. And then he gave us a new command. And then we, we certainly didn't need any more of those. So, what was the problem? The problem? Jesus was the problem. The crowds loved him. The crowds flocked to him. And the crowds not only believed him, they were beginning to believe in him. That was a problem. So, we took care of it. You mean, you killed him? No, Rome killed him. Lucky for us, it was one of his own that led us to him. And once we had him, well, all the other peasants scattered, as we suspected they would. But let's be clear, we did not kill him. Jesus of Nazareth. King of the Jews. I should have made him their king. I saw more courage, more integrity in those eyes than in the eyes of any of their high priests. They were jealous. Ask my wife. I tried to save him. But as soon as I mentioned king, we have no king but Caesar, they chanted. And in that moment, I realized I had no choice. crucified their king. But for the record, they are responsible, not me. It doesn't matter now. What matters now is that Passover is over. Things will settle down now. So, what do you do now? We hide. We wait. Didn't he say he'd be back? Yeah, yeah, he, uh... <sighs> he said a lot of things. More than you have room to write. So, do you think he'll be back? Back? I don't know. I don't think so. Nobody saw that coming, and the reason why we are celebrating Easter here today. My name is Andy. Welcome. We're so glad all of you are here. You met Joel and Sion and several other people, and uh, hopefully the pancakes were okay. Yeah. Four of you. That's a little late. Too late. It's okay. It's all right. A little late there. Uh, we'll keep working on it. But anyway, we're just glad you're here, and that was the question 2,000 years ago that nobody expected Jesus to come back. I mean, nobody saw that coming. There were a lot of people following Jesus. Jesus was a rock star in the first century. 
Hundreds of thousands of people would follow him, look for him. He fed people. He healed people. He had incredible teachings. And uh, he, he just had people following him. He truly was a rock star in the first century. And, um, but something happened. On the third day, uh, before the resurrection, before what we are celebrating here on the third day, um, on Friday was, uh, we call it Good Friday, but uh, good for us, but not good for Jesus because he died. Everything that Jesus had done uh, was uh, talking about himself, really. Um, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty narrow. It has to go through Jesus. I and the Father, God, are one. So, and I am God, I am the Messiah. And so people were following Jesus, people were following the teachings of Jesus, people were like, could not get enough of him. But he painted himself in such a tight corner that if Jesus is not alive, the dream is dead. There's nothing to keep going because it was all about him. Like when Buddha had uh, continued Buddhism, uh, his teachings continued on with his followers. It doesn't matter if Buddha's alive or dead. The same thing with Muhammad. It doesn't matter uh, if he's alive or dead. The teachings keep going. But the Jesus' teachings, you can't keep going on your own because Jesus made it all about him. And if it's all about Jesus and he's not alive... The dream is dead. Everything that we had hoped for, for was dead. That he would be the king, that he would deliver us from Rome because Rome was holding them captive. And on this week that they were celebrating the Passover feast of what God did with the Israelites hundreds of years earlier with Moses, or I'm sorry, Charlton Hesson in the Ten Commandments. Young people didn't get that, but anyway. And, and so delivered them out of Egypt and the angel of death passed over the Jews, and they were set free from their captivity. So it's a bittersweet week. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was going into Jerusalem, they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Jesus is the king, our king. He will deliver us from the Roman emperors and Roman rule and will set us free again the way God delivered us hundreds of years earlier with Moses and setting us free from the Egyptians. And that's what they were hoping for. And that's what they were thinking. But in order to have a king, in order to have a savior, in order to have a deliverer, that person needs to be alive. So people were following Jesus because they were thinking and hoping that you'll deliver us from Rome and that captivity. So the day that Jesus died on Friday, three days before Easter, the dream was dead. Everybody was following, but the moment that Jesus died on the cross, the dream is dead. There's no more dream. We cannot pass on his teachings because he made it all about himself. So this is something that happened here. Just next slide. Um, a lot of people unfollow Jesus. Did you ever happen this? <laughs> ever happen, have this happen to you? Doesn't it hurt when people start to unfollow you? I call them. I'm like, hey, I noticed that you uh, stopped following me yeah, on social media. Kind of hurts a little bit. Everybody press the button and follow. And Peter, who you saw in that story, had fought, been following Jesus for three years. And John, who we're going to look at the story, they had been following Jesus. And they had been putting their hope and their dream. And there's a little competition between Peter and John. Because they're walking on the road. They're going with Jesus and going, hey, the moment you become king, who's going to sit on your right hand and left hand? Who's going to be vice president? And, you know, uh, I don't know. They're looking for who, a position in the new kingdom. And Jesus is like, they don't get it, they don't get it, they don't get it, they don't get it. But anyway, they're like, this, is, this was their dream. So the moment that Jesus died, they know that they're following Jesus. And so what are they thinking? They're hiding out. Rome, Pilate, is also going to be looking for us. We're next to go up on the cross. So there's no courage here. There is nobody, keep the dream alive, keep the dream alive. There's nobody outside of the tomb going, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to come back alive. So on three days, let's be out there early and let's all sing and then have a service and then we'll do a countdown right before the sun rises. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. There's nobody outside of the tomb. The dream is dead. And nobody was expecting anything to happen on that morning. The only thing that happened was there was this person, and we'll look at her story. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early in the morning. Why did Mary go to the tomb early on Sunday morning? Because 
late Friday night, before sundown or before the Sabbath or Saturday, you're not allowed to work to do or do anything on Saturday. So there were two men. There was Nicodemus, and you can read his story in John chapter 3, who came to Jesus late at night because he's a Pharisee, he's a religious leader, and he's asking Jesus questions about how do I experience this eternal life? I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher of the law, I'm a religious person, I have a PhD in religion, but I don't know, you have something that I don't have. And then there's another guy by the name of Joseph, Joseph Hermias, and he was just a wealthy, wealthy man who probably is the one who donated the tomb. Not everybody in the first century would have a tomb. So Joseph, we believe, was a very wealthy man, and Nicodemus was also a very wealthy religious person. So they probably, we don't know this, but we're guessing, they probably, we know that they buried Jesus and took his body on Friday night. You would entomb the body and put spices and so forth. We believe that the reason why Mary went early in the morning to get into the tomb is because she probably was thinking there was a bunch of men who were embalming the body and they did it wrong. <laughs> Ladies, have you ever thought that? <laughs> of course, they did it wrong. So here is our story. Nobody's expecting anything. It's completely unexpected. People press the button, unfollow. There, are no, there is no courage. There are no people saying, keep the dream alive. There is nobody saying, yes, I believe, and I'm going to keep his teachings alive. Nobody was saying it because Jesus painted himself in such a tight corner. So nobody, nobody, nobody was expecting a nobody. Get it? Okay. John chapter 1, here is the Easter story and why we're here today celebrating. Early. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, who is one of the followers of Jesus, she was healed by Jesus and believed he was the Son of God. She's the only woman, only person, who then went early in the morning to take care of the body. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the tomb, uh, sorry, that, that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Verse 2, so, I love that, so, conclusion, I mean, what do I do? She, she came running to Simon Peter. In other words, Simon Peter, John, all the disciples are hiding out. They think they're next. They think Pilate is looking for them as well. There is no courage. There is no, <laughs> keep the dream alive. These guys are running scared. And so she goes back to Jerusalem, into town, wherever they're hiding, and to the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and John, who is writing this, he writes himself in the third person, which is kind of interesting, kind of weird, but anyway, he always was saying, Jesus loved me more than anybody else. And there's a little competition here that's going on, and he actually writes himself into the story, like it was between me and Peter, who did Jesus love more? We believe that John came from a very wealthy family, where mom was always telling, you're the best, uh, I love you, you're number one. She was always saying, Jesus, Jesus, will my son be the vice president when you're king, right? Because he's my boy. I love John. Don't you love John? We all love John. Spoiled John, we believe John had a bit of what we all have, entitlement. So anyway, John says, uh, says to them, the one Jesus loved, speaking of himself, John. And she said, they have, what's the next word they have? Everybody, they have, it's not up there. Can you see it? Yep, they've taken him. Why did she think that they had taken him? Because he's dead. <laughs> he doesn't walk by himself. He actually was taken. Somebody had to do it because she is expecting a body. And if the body is not there, somebody moved the body. So they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and, they, and, and we don't know where they have put him. Verse 3, so Peter and the other disciple, John, started, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, John, speaking of himself, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So through the years, we know that John was a faster runner than Peter. In other words, he's letting us all know, I won the race. Great, John. So he runs. He runs to the tomb. He bent over and he looked in, uh, he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Question, why did John not go in? 
It's a tomb. It's creepy. I don't know. I wouldn't go in. I agree. So he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came. It gets harder in a minute. So it, it, that's not a trick question. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He's the courageous one. He's kind of the, he's not an idiot, but he's always sticking his foot in the mouth. He saw the strips of linen lying there and as well, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in the place separate from the linen. Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb. She's crying. She's weeping. The dream is dead. Her Savior is dead. She's grieving. She's hurting. She's just having, a, I mean, she's hurting. She's hurting. She's grieving. And she bent over to look into the tomb. She also went and looked and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head of the other at the foot. And here's the age-old question that, will get answered, was answered here in this story that we've all probably asked. Are angels men or women? Are they guys or girls? We, what are angels? And so here we have it. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? This is why we know angels are men. Because only a man would ask a woman, why are you crying? <laughs> only a man would ask that. There's humor in the story. And she said to the angels, they have, one more time, taken my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. They put him somewhere. And uh, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize that it was Jesus. I think Mary Magdalene told this story for the rest of her life, that I was at the tomb, I was looking for Jesus, he wasn't there, and this is what happened. And he asked her, um, he asked her, verse 15, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? That's a great question for all of us. Who are you looking for? Husband, wife, I don't know. I, you know. What are you looking for? We're all as human beings looking for something, all of us. What are you looking for? Who are you looking for? To fulfill the needs and the, the desires and you know, the heart that's inside of every single one of us, we have been given hearts that are longing for a reconnection with our Lord and Savior, that our maker, our God, our Father in heaven. All of us, every single human being, we have that longing. And she's looking. And she thought it was Jesus, but now she's disappointed. Who are you looking for? My question to you, who are you looking for? What are you looking for? Has it satisfied you? And then thinking he was the gardener. I think she told this for the rest of her lives. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you put him? I will go get him. And then Jesus said in the most powerful words, he calls her by name. This is emotional. Mary, 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 it's me. You see, Jesus calls every single one of us by name, and the desire of the heart of every human being is to be known and to belong. Mary, Mary, John, Joe, Susie, Frank, Ellen. Hello, it's me, it's me. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not come yet. Not yet uh, for I have not yet ascended to the, uh, to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your father, our God, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples and told them the news. I have, what's the next word? I have seen him. That is the message of Easter, and that's why we believe. And it makes an impact in every single one of our lives. It's not about what we believe that or what is your religion or what are your tenets and what does, you know, Buddhism say or uh, Islam or Christianity? You know, what are all these things? And I'm not sure if I'm really, a, you know, a Jesus follower, a church person. Churches are for church people. I'm not a church person, so I don't go to church. That's not for me. They have much rules. And if they knew who I was and where I've been, they would kick me out. I just know that. And Jesus is gone, Mary, Joe, Susie, Frank, Andy. I don't want something from you. And Christianity is not about following a bunch of rules to get God to love you. 
That's not the covenant. That's not the agreement God has with us. That's what communion is. And Jesus said, I'm giving you a new covenant, a new relationship with God. That it's not based on your behavior. It's not based on your merit. It's not based on your past or how good you are because you're good and you're good and my good ain't good enough. I love Barry Bonds and I love baseball. The best he ever did was bat 400. I don't know of a baseball player yet that's batted 1,000. And the only people that can go to heaven are those who batted 1,000. That's it. Perfect. Are you perfect? If you are, I'd like to talk to you, and there's a counselor in the back. But anyway, there's no such thing as a perfect person. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And God doesn't expect that. We're broken. We have sin. We've, you know, we got stuff. And so Jesus came to help us with and deal with our stuff the things that we can't handle. And so Mary Magdalene says, I have seen, and don't miss this. The reason why we believe in what we believe is not because you need to believe some tenets, some rules or religion in order to be accepted. It's not believe that. Christianity is all about belief in a person. And the reason why we have intellectual integrity in believing in what we believe in is because something that happened in history And that Jesus died on a cross and he rose from the dead. And here's why I believe. That these guys that were sitting, scared, huddled up, we're next, we're going to die, total cowards, ended up leaving Jerusalem, talking all over the world because of something they had seen. In other words, they're having breakfast with Jesus. He's like dead and now he's alive. Can you imagine that? You're like sitting there going, I hear you, but right now I'm just looking at you, dude. You're alive, right? You're like walking around. I mean, Jesus is hanging out at Starbucks. He also, Jesus loved Blue Bottle. But anyway, he goes to Howard, Howdy's, gets a taco. He's talking to people for 40 days. Jesus is walking around Jerusalem. There's a dead man walking around. We saw him die and he's alive. In that moment, these cowards who denied him, ran away, scared to death, they are bold, courageous, and said, you got to kill me. Because I cannot deny what my eyes have seen, what my ears have heard, what my hands have touched. I can't deny it. I mean, I saw him. I hung out with him. We had a good time. He's alive. And now you're like, no, no, that's not true. You're going to have to kill us, which they eventually did. And the reason why I believe in what we believe is not because, oh, I could be a pastor here and say, well, the Bible said so. It's in the Bible. I believe in the Bible, but the Bible didn't come until 250 to 300 years after these events. The things that were written down here were just a few years later. The Apostle Paul then and and Luke, who is a writer and one of the uh, people who investigated all of these events, and he writes this book of Acts, all of the events, and he, he records in history what happened. That in that recording and in that history, they're like, no, these these men, these people were alive and courageous and bold because they saw something. Jesus is alive. You're going to have to kill me. I mean, later on in the book of Acts, verse th- uh, chapter 3, verse 14, they said, you disowned the holy righteous one. In other words, they're talking to the religious people. I mean, their message was this. You killed him. We saw him. Say you're sorry. And repent, change your ways. That was their message. That was the sermon every week at church. Because they said and ended up saying, uh, the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released. All of you, all of you did that. Remember, we all raised our head. We want Barabbas, we want Barabbas. Remember that, remember that? They're like, yeah, 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 we did. Their heads are down. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are, what's the next word? We are witnesses of this. We saw it with our eyes. You see, the people in history that are telling us the story are witnesses to this event. And they are simply telling us and every person they can think of, this really happened. You see, the reason why I believe is not because there's some tenets, some cool teachings. There's great teachings. But none of them are like, hey, I got to tell you the story of the prodigal son. It's really cool. Great story that Jesus told. They, They didn't do that. Their message was, he was dead. He's alive. And this is changing history from B.C. to A.D. Because he was dead and he's alive. And the reason why I believe with intellectual integrity that this happened in history, it's not some fable. 
Usually it takes two to 300 years for a fable to become a fable in a society. There's pretty, plenty of people, uh, English majors, I can tell you, philosophy majors, that things become a story. They're like, no, this, this was like just a couple of years later, they're writing this down. The reason why today we can celebrate is because Jesus is alive and because Jesus is alive and real, God is alive. There is a God who loves us and knows your name and knows my name. I'm a believer here today because Jesus is alive and he's in my heart. When we ask him, come into my life and I give you my life. When we do that, the Holy Spirit comes and he says, I'm, I'm going to be a part of your life. I don't want something from you. I want to give you something. Because of that, when I pray, when I pray, there's a God who listens and who actually answers prayer. And the God that I pray to, that we pray to, is the God who raised Jesus from the dead. So whatever is broken in you, whatever seems hopeless in you, that God who created the heavens and the earth and this beauty that we're looking out is the God who's in this room right now, and he loves you and he calls you by name and has the power to answer any of your prayers. The God that I worship and the reason why I believe and I'm so grateful, what are the benefits of Easter? The benefits of Easter is that young people, listen to this, I'm not going to talk to the old people, they're too old, it's too late. The young people, young people, you have a purpose that what you do in this life matters in this life and it matters through eternity. You have a purpose in every decision that you make, that God wants something bigger and better and he wants you to experience the fullness of life and he has a plan for your life. The reason why I love this and that God is alive and he's real in my life because he's taught me to, to love because it is not about me and it doesn't come naturally. But the God who loved me, who gave his life for me, now because I've received that gift, I can do that for others. So it doesn't matter what people think because I'm loved by God. The reason why I love this and it's so real is because the God who died on the cross, he forgave me of my sins. You see, we can't give something that we ain't got. And when we experience God's forgiveness and we receive that gift of forgiveness, I can give you the gift of forgiveness. And the one thing that's guaranteed for our entire lives is somebody is going to eventually hurt you. Has anybody ever hurt you? Are you sitting next to him? Don't raise your hand. And because of that, I've received, as it's done for me, I can give it to somebody else. Amen? And I can go on and on and on. I can be generous with my stuff. My stuff doesn't control me. Because the God that, who loves me and calls, his, calls me his child and loves me, he's real, he's alive, he continues to bless me so I can be a blessing to others. It's a joy to be generous. Live life this way. So many of us live like this, clenched fists. But when we have experienced God's generosity, for God so loved the world, God's a loving God, that he loves the world that he, anybody that he gave, that he gave as his one and only son, that whoever believes in, puts our faith in, trust in, say, yes, God, we will then experience eternal life, not only here now, but forever and ever. It's a gift that we only, the only thing we need to do is receive. And I can go on and go on and on. I cannot imagine doing life without God in my life. He's alive. He's real. Life is hard enough without God, is it not? I can't imagine doing life without God. And so God wants us here to hear this story from Mary Magdalene. And what's amazing about this and also why I believe in this story, women were not allowed to go to court to give testimony. It was... Uh, Male society in the first century. There were children. So when Jesus said, let the children come unto me, he was breaking every status you can imagine. Children were always in the back, always in the back. And then the women were lower and so on. Jesus was always elevating people, always elevating people and women and children and, and destroying all of the, the societal, you know, the caste system basically in that first century. And who is telling us the story? Mary. Yes, Mary. If you're trying to convince somebody, you would not write this story that Mary is a part of it. Because in the first century, everybody would go, I, will, I don't believe it. Because you would never have a woman give testimony. So why did they have Mary Magdalene give testimony to the story of Easter and why we're here today? Because that's what happened. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> and we can believe here too, also, with having intellectual integrity. 
And we can believe here today that God is, a, is real, who he says he is. He sent us his son. And Jesus wants to be a part of every one of your lives. And today, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And he names us, and I'm here. And I don't want something from you. I created the heavens and the earth. I don't need anything from you. I want something for you, something that has better, something that's purposeful. And I want you to experience the freedom and new life and no longer have the things that are dead in you hold you hostage. Be free because Jesus is alive. Amen. Let me ask the band to come up and we're going to sing. And the last song that we're going to sing is called Death um, is Resurrected in Life, that he takes our ashes and brings life into every single one of us. As we sing these songs, and I just want you to hear this first part of this song, and just bow your heads right now and close your eyes, and let me pray for us and we will close. God, thank you for this opportunity to be here today and celebrate and sing, and eat, even pancakes, and come together. Lord, I just pray that today, anybody in this room who may even just be curious a little bit, that we would take a little step. It's a little scary, we're uncertain, but God, for all of us who have had a perception of what Christianity is and what church is, God, today, we just know that the message is good news. You're alive, and you love us, and... Uh, God, we can follow you. And right now, if there's anybody in this room right now, you would just pray this prayer with me. There's no magic in these words, but just pray with me. Dear, dear Jesus, I'm, I'm broken. I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. And I've been looking for something that would fill this thirst and quench this thirst in my soul that I keep looking everywhere else for something that would fill me. God, today, I invite you into my life. Thank you for bringing new life. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Cause he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, our fear is gone, cause I know my redeemed. Testifies this life within me cries. I know He holds the future, and life is worth living just because He lives. Very same God. That spins things in orbit Runs to the weary The warm and the weak And the same gentle hands That hold me when I'm broken They conquer death and bring me victory
Stand as we celebrate our God who has defeated death itself. Own my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. But made a way to let mercy come in. When death was resting, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose without. for you to come back next Friday, and uh, we have an incredible event here at the church, free pizza, as Joel said earlier. We would love for you to take the next step. It's time for us to be human again. Don't you agree? 
So we just want to gather again, just have some fun. Joel explain and he can look at it. But we have the comedian, magician. He's going to be great. Just a fun evening. It's time to laugh a little bit again, reconnect with people, build community. We're done with COVID. So anyway, uh, we just want to have a little bit of fun. Love for you to come back on Friday. My wife has been watching kids all morning over in the children's area. And I got a text from her and she said, please tell the parents to come get your kids now. Something like, something like that. So if you have kids, please go get them. Um, we don't want them to stay here. So go get them. God bless you. Have a great day. Happy Easter. God bless.